On today's show, the Yankees hire Omar Minaya, the Pirates are asking way too much for Brian Reynolds, and I have some thoughts about Hall of Fame voting. I promise every year that I'm not going to let it get to me, and every year without fail, I let it get to me. We're going to talk about all that and more on an all-new Locked on Yankees, starting now. You are Locked on Yankees, your daily New York Yankees podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Happy Friday, Yankee fans. Welcome to an all new Locked On Yankees, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Stacey Gotsoulias. I'm a baseball writer turned podcast host, and I've been hosting this show since 2018. A lot of stuff has happened since 2018. I'd like to thank you for making Locked On Yankees your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can watch and subscribe to us on YouTube. Also, hit the thumbs up button to like our videos and the bell so you're notified as soon as our videos go live. Oh, before we get into everything, congratulations to Garrett and Amy Cole. They had their second child the day after New Year's, a child named Everett and... Caden, the oldest, is already enjoying being a big brother. That's according to the Yes Hot Stove Show that I watched the replay of this morning. And speaking of the Hot Stove Show on Yes, Omar Minaya was on, being interviewed by Bob Lorenz, and it was interesting listening to him talk. The reason why he came to the Yankees now was because the Yankees actually offered him a position last March but he was already working with Major League Baseball and wanted to stay with Major League Baseball because of all the new initiatives that they were doing this year, this past year with, you know, the draft and all that stuff that was happening with the lottery. And he says it's an honor to be with the Yankees. And it's just really funny because I feel like the Yankees are just scooping up all these old school GMs from other places and bringing them to the Yankees and kind of, hmm, not, I wouldn't say take a step back because Manaya explained in his interview that he works with both scouting and analytics because the biggest knock on the Yankees, even though they use analytics, they don't use them correctly. It doesn't feel like they use them correctly, especially the analytics that kept telling them to play IKF every day at shortstop. So... <laughs> It was just interesting to listen to Manaya talk about joining the Yankees. Bob Lorenz asked him about being from New York, his alliance, because, you know, he was with the Mets for a while, and he's a Queens boy, and Manaya said that. He's like, you know, I'm a Queens boy, and, you know, when you're from a certain borough, that is your place. You know, if you're from Brooklyn, you're proud of me being from Brooklyn. If you're from Staten Island, you're proud of being from Staten Island in most cases. I lived there for a year. I'm, that's all I'm going to say. Um, but he said he went to that day at Yankee Stadium in the 70s, early 70s. You know, like Bobby Mercer, Horace Clark, like those days, the, the lean days of the Yankees. And he said that, um, or even the late 60s too, because he was mentioning some of those players. And he was just saying how baseball has been a part of his life for his whole life. And, uh, you know, it's cool for the Yankees to get guys with that experience um, with Manaya and Sabian, but it does seem kind of funny that instead of hiring younger people to help with the front office and analytics and scouting and that sort of thing, they're going with the guys who have been around the game longer. I understand experience is a big part of it, but the game of baseball is changing. I did like that Manaya acknowledged the changing of the game and how he's adapted to the changing of the game. So I'm, I'm hoping that that actually works in the Yankees' favor. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting hire. You know, he was the first Latin GM. You know, everyone knows about his days with the Mets. They're well documented. He's been in the game of baseball for a really long time. He's 64, Sabian 66. And, you know, I joked the other day on the show that they're around the time in life where people are normally retiring. 
I know someone who just retired who's actually 58. So, <laughs> you know, some people who can retire early or retiring early and other people just want to keep working. And hey, good for Sabian and Omar Minaya for wanting to keep working and taking the jobs with the Yankees. And the other part of the hot stove show, we're going to talk about in segment three, because it has to do with the Hall of Fame voting. And as I said in the open, I always joke every year that I'm not gonna let the Hall of Fame voting get to me. And every year I let it get to me. So here are some quotes from Omar Minaya, who, I didn't even say his title, did I? He's a senior advisor to baseball operations. And it's just funny because, as I said, they announced Brian Sabian and then they announced Omar Minaya. And it's just like the Yankees are scooping up all these old GMs from different teams. So Minaya said, it's an honor. This is a successful organization, but the goal every year is to win the World Series. I'm looking forward to doing whatever Brian and the staff want from me. Manaya said that he believes his addition as well as Sabians could add balance to the Bombers' internal operations. The club has been criticized in recent years for its heavy reliance on uh, analytics. While Manaya and Sabian both believe in statistical analysis, they are expected to lend voices to old school scouting techniques. Again, it's not the heavy reliance on analytics. It's interpreting the analytics incorrectly. Again, IKF was not one of the best shortstops in baseball. And yet Brian Cashman, no, not Brian Cashman, Aaron Boone insisted on saying that he was. We all watched. We all watched the games. He was not one of the best shortstops in baseball. There were many times that if the first baseman, whoever happened to be playing, didn't make a play on their end, it would have been bad for IKF and it would have skewed the numbers to where they probably should have been <laughs> if it weren't for his teammates bailing him out all the time. So I know a lot of people complain about the heavy reliance on analytics, all the old school baseball teams, you know, they're players, they're real players. You know, you don't have to look at numbers all the time. But, you know, there are other teams that look at numbers a lot and they're doing really well, like the Astros. So I don't like the whole, they're too heavy, they're too heavily reliant on analytics. No, as I said, they interpret those analytics incorrectly. I feel like they need to use younger people <laughs> to interpret the analytics to help Aaron Boone make the better decisions in game than he has been the past few seasons. And especially, I mean, this last playoff run really exposed Aaron Boone. And what did the Yankees do? They rewarded him by keeping him on. So, Manaya said, you're looking at somewhere close to 70 plus years experience in different roles. I think what we're going to bring to the group is experience in scouting leadership and team building because we've done it. We started off as scouts. That's what we like to do. We're blessed to be where we are in our careers to be able to scout from top to bottom. Now, Manaya revealed that in the past, they worked on a deal in 2018 that could have sent Zach Wheeler to the Bronx. Now there was the infamous Mike Stanton for Felix Heredia trade in 2003. And if you were on old time Yankee message boards like NYY fans back in the day, and you uh, know of me on that board, I was Stacy Rosie. I always complained about Joe Torrey's heavy reliance on Felix Heredia, especially in 2004 the year we never speak of. So Omar, so Omar Minaya hired by the Yankees to help with scouting. And we'll see how it goes. So in a moment, we're going to talk about the Pirates, Brian Reynolds, and a problem I have with the current state of Major League Baseball. But first, looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, so you got to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a lot healthier this year. And if you're like me, where you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise taste, then I've got something for you. You got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, though. They're so delicious, you won't think that they're good for you. And it's perfect for your New Year's resolutions. And what makes Built Bar so good is that they're covered in 100% chocolate. Real chocolate. And they come in really good flavors. You have churro 
peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, and I'm not sure how they do it, but every bar that they make tastes like a candy bar. And what's even better is they're healthy. They maintain amazing macros for you. So they're only 130 calories, they have four grams of sugar and 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been telling you to order the boxes at Built.com, but now you can get them at Walmart and Sam's Club. That's right, head to your nearest Walmart, Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or you can pick up coconut puffs. And if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13 bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. Thanks for making Locked On Yankees your first listen every day. Now you can make your second listen Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So here's the problem I have with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And we know that the Yankees are in the market for a left fielder. And we know that Brian Reynolds is available and that he wants to be traded. And herein lies the problem. The Pirates are asking the Yankees for a ridiculous package for Brian Reynolds. They basically want top prospects, like a number of them. A number of them. It came out today, the Pirates offered Brian Reynolds a six-year contract worth $75 million. If he's only worth... Six years, $75 million, which is what, $12.5 million a year? Why are you asking for guys like Peraza and Volpe? You're not going to do anything with them. The Pirates don't do anything. They don't spend money. They constantly trade people away. They never build a foundation for a team because their owner doesn't like to spend money. Why should the Yankees give away half their farm to a team that's not going to do anything? People always complain about Steve Cohen. He's spending too much money. He's driving the prices up. Other teams can't compete with him. No. Every team can spend money. They choose not to. They go by this whole, oh, well, we're a small market. We shouldn't be spending money thing. If I were a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, I would be pissed. And I think they are at this point. Because the the team is going nowhere. They're going nowhere. And the owner doesn't want to do anything about it. They're not going to do anything with the Yankees prospects once they get them. They're not going to build a team around them. They're not going to spend money to get other people and build a team that's going to contend. They're just going to middle. They're not going to do anything. So why should the Yankees give them such a big package for someone that they don't think is worth more than $12.5 million a year? It's ludicrous. So Steve Cohen isn't the problem. I know Hal Steinbrenner complained about Steve Cohen spending too much money, which is why the Yankees needed to spend more money and gave Judge the extra year and spent the money on Carlos Rodon. You're the Yankees. Spend money. You're the Pirates. Spend some money. Any money? (laughs) Yeah. The problem isn't Steve Cohen. The problem is teams like the, the Pirates that just don't do anything to try and win. The Reds are also kind of a problem, but the Pirates are the worst out of all the teams that don't spend. Because, you know, the Rays don't spend, but they're better at scouting and they're better at picking up players and finding these guys that out of nowhere play well. But the Pirates don't even do that. They just roll these teams out year after year. I don't know why people even go to Pirates games. You don't want it to be, we spoke about this a couple weeks ago. You don't want to be a fan of a team where you don't expect anything. Spring training rolls around and you're not even excited about the team. You have nothing to be excited about. As much as you like baseball, baseball could be your favorite sport from the time that you were in your mother's womb. (laughs) You know? You come out loving baseball, wearing baseball onesies. Your parents dress you up, give you a glove, a hat. I mean, even I had that stuff. And I was a baby girl, but I was also the firstborn, so... My dad kind of did that for me. And I had a lot of baseball themed toys when I was a kid, before my brother was born. I had a Peanuts um, mini pinball machine that was baseball themed. And the pinball machine had gloves on it that trapped the ball, the pinball. It was Charlie Brown. It was great. Um, 
So even if you grew up loving baseball, there's only so much you can take as a baseball fan. And if your team repeatedly does not put out a team that's going to do anything, why would you want to go? I wouldn't want to go. I joked the other day when I did the Way Back Wednesday segment talking about 2013 and how I had the Sunday plan and how the Yankees lost the majority of the games. It wasn't fun, but the Yankees weren't terrible. They were 85 and 77. You know, they weren't under 500. They finished in third place, which, okay, not great, but still not last place. And it isn't a repeated thing for like seven or eight years in a row and for decades at this point for the Pirates because how many times have the Pirates competed in the last 40, what are we up to, 44 years since they won? Holy crap. In 1979? So they have nerve, they have nerve asking for as much as they're asking for, for Brian Reynolds. Brian Reynolds is a fine player, but he's not worth guys like Volpe, Peraza, and Dominguez. My friend joked that the Yankees should offer Hicks and a pizza. And at this point, the Pirates don't even deserve the pizza. And by the way, I'm not the only one who feels this way. Most Yankee fans feel this way, but Randy Wilkins, who was the director of the Captain documentary, he said the Pirates want some insane trade package for Brian Reynolds while also presenting him an insulting six years for $75 million offer. They are not a serious franchise in any shape or form. How does that make any damn sense? And it's true. I just said it. It doesn't make any sense. And no, they don't even deserve the pizza. Just give them Hicks. They don't even deserve that. I think, actually, I think Aaron Hicks could probably stand a change of pace, a change of setting. Although I, uh, no, I don't think he deserves to go to the Pirates though. I feel like sending someone to the Pirates is like sending someone to purgatory. I mean, it is. <laughs> they don't do anything. They don't do anything. So in a moment, I'm going to complain about Hall of Fame voting. I'm going to complain about hypocrisy because every damn year I say I'm not going to, and I do. So That'll be happening in a moment, but first. Okay. I complain about this every year. I really do. I try not to pay attention to it. What I really need to do, okay. Ryan Thibodeau is the one that keeps track of all of the Hall of Fame ballots. The writers send them to him and he has a tracker. He's been doing this for quite a few years now. And he will tweet out and a few people that work with him will tweet out the ballots and show everyone how voters went. But then you have voters who write articles explaining why they voted a certain way and why they voted for one guy but didn't vote for this guy. And Ken Rosenthal wrote something the other day about his voting and why he voted the way he did. And I had a problem with it. And I said something slightly obnoxious, but not, it was slightly obnoxious. I couldn't help myself because I get really angry about this stuff sometimes because I don't like, as I said in the teaser, the hypocrisy of these writers who talk about all the problems they have with PEDs. And yet, okay, so he wrote a whole column about why he voted for certain people and didn't vote for certain people. You'll notice I remain a no on Alex Rodriguez and Manny Ramirez. I voted in the past for players alleged or confirmed to have used performing enhancing drugs, including Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. I draw the line with Rodriguez and Ramirez because they were both suspended after Major League Baseball established firm rules and penalties using PEDs. So I quote tweeted him and said, oh, so that's why you voted for David Ortiz. Got it. Now, one of my friends who's a writer for Baseball Prospectus, said, the rule that led to A-Rod's suspension is just some stuff MLB made up because they couldn't get him on a drug test, which is true. So if you're going by the guys who showed up on the 2003 list that we're all told to not pay attention to, you should have A-Rod there as well. Now, Manny is a different thing. Manny was suspended... 
He was caught a couple times, right? <laughs> right? He tested positive a couple of times, and that I kind of understand. But the whole hypocrisy of, well, these guys might have done it, but they weren't suspended. So, no. Stop. Stop. Drives me crazy. And then Jack Curry said the same thing on the hot stove show last night. He waited till the last ballot to vote for Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens because they didn't test positive. But he didn't vote for Manny and A-Rod because they were suspended. Um, But I just don't like the whole hypocrisy where they all seem to forget that David Ortiz linked to steroids. He's still trying to find the guys that gave him the steroids that he didn't know he was taking. Please. And if you're not watching on YouTube, I just air quoted that entire thing. I will say... I am enjoying some of the people who are putting Manny and A-Rod on their list. It's not a big number, but there are a bunch of first-time voters who are doing it, the younger guard that are coming in because they have enough years as baseball writers to be able to vote in the Hall of Fame, and some of the older guard are leaving. And I love how upset people get with their ballots when they see Manny and A-Rod on the ballot. Look... Alex Rodriguez is one of the best players to ever play the game of baseball. He was. Was he chemically enhanced? Yes. There are a lot of guys who were chemically enhanced that we don't even know about. And it wasn't just batters. It was hit. It was uh, pitchers too. Just because they weren't caught doesn't mean they weren't doing it. You know, everyone thinks Jose Canseco is crazy when he talks about numbers of guys who were doing PEDs and the percentages. I wouldn't be surprised. And the other thing that drives me crazy is the fact that Bud Selig is in the Hall of Fame. And I say this every year, too. So you're going to allow that guy in the Hall of Fame, the guy who didn't care about steroids when the home run race was happening. He was practically sticking that stuff into Sosa and McGuire because baseball needed people in the seats again after the lockout and the, or the strike in 1994. So... How are you going to let Bud Selig into the Hall of Fame, who turned a blind eye until the government got involved, which is still a farce to me. The whole Mitchell report and the hearings and all that stuff was just ridiculous. So how are you going to let that that guy in the Hall of Fame, but not allow the players in the Hall of Fame? It's ridiculous. It's a museum. And you don't think guys were still using, we know guys are still using because guys are still getting caught with stuff all these years later after all this stuff was implemented. So the Hall of Fame results are coming out later in the month. We'll see what happens. Um, Actually, I haven't looked at the latest tracker to see how people are doing, but there was one guy, what's his name? Juan Vene, who apparently is 93 years old. And I think it's going to be the last ballot that he's handing in. Zero. He did not vote for anyone. (laughs) Why? There are Hall of Fame guys all over that ballot. Just pick one, even one. Why would you do none? I also don't take, like, I don't take writers like that seriously also. Like the people who only write in three. On that entire ballot, there's more than three guys who should be in the Hall of Fame. See, I'm letting it get to me. Who, like I said, it's just a museum. Put the steroids guys in a steroid room. That sounds really weird, but you know what I mean. (laughs) It's an era of baseball that happened, right? So just, I, I don't say honor it, but it's part of baseball history. It's a museum that shows baseball history. And when you keep these guys out, it's like you're erasing that part of history. Does that make sense? So I know a lot of people don't like the whole PED thing, but... It's not like two or three guys were doing it. It's not like the hitters were the only guys who were doing it. There were pitchers who were using it too. Because it was readily available. And again, the commissioner who let it all happen is in the Hall of Fame. Without any fight. Hypocrisy. Okay. I've ranted enough about that. So, Omar Minaya part of the front office with the Yankees, along with Brian Sabian. We're going old school. We'll see how it goes. The Pirates are asking way too much for Brian Reynolds, and they should be ashamed of themselves for never fielding a competitive team. And baseball should do something about that. 
And Hall of Fame voting has gotten to me again. And it'll get to me again next year because it always does. What are you going to do? <laughs> so tonight, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on YouTube only, I'm doing a live show where we're going to be looking at baseball cards that I got sent to me. And did I say 7.30? 7. 7 p.m. Eastern. I don't know why I keep saying 7.30. 7. 7. I sound like Monica from Friends. 7. 7. We're going to look at baseball cards because some of them are very interesting. They're former Yankees, Hall of Fame players, random guys that you probably don't even know of. There's a card with a major mistake on it that's pretty funny. And um, yeah, there's Fleer, there's Tops, it's everything. So we're going to look at those live on YouTube. I will put up... A pre-link so you can get notified as soon as I go live. So look for that. But for now, that's it for this episode of Locked On Yankees, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Remember that you can listen on every podcasting platform available. You can watch and subscribe to us on YouTube. Again, hit the thumbs up button, comment on YouTube, and click the bell so you know when our videos go live. And thank you for making Locked On Yankees your first listen every day. Make your second listen, Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. And as I say every day, he loves Oswaldo Cabrera. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So enjoy your Friday. I'll look for you later on YouTube. And if you're not going to be there, have a good weekend.